Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are, I hope you're doing well. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Shara Patel, and I'm Hoppin's Head of Product Marketing based here in the Bay Area, where it's about 9 a.m. in the morning, and I'm so excited to start my day off with you all. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our third show of Hoppin's Customer Spotlight Series. This is a new monthly event where each installment is focused on a different topic. Today, we're driving into higher education, and this is especially near and dear to my heart, having grown up as the daughter of a professor. Academia has been a part of our dinner conversation for as long as I can remember, and I think my dad is actually here joining us today, so shout out to him. Hi, Appa. Back to our panel. Today, we have three outstanding guests who have used Hopin to shake up the way they've approached recruiting, activities, professional development, and so much more in their respective campuses. We all know that the pandemic has hit the education space, especially hard over the past year, and institutions were forced to pivot quickly to ensure that they were reaching their goals and making sure that their students had all of the right resources. Being physically in school is supposed to foster connections amongst students, so I can't wait to hear about how our guests have faced these unique challenges over the past year and come up with creative solutions using Hopin. So let's get right into it. We'll start with intros, have a chat for about 30 minutes, and then we'll save about 10 minutes at the end to get audience questions. So feel free to submit any questions you have via the Q&A tab that you see to the right throughout the next 30 minutes. So that's it for housekeeping. Let's go ahead and meet our panelists. First up, we have Angelica Gonzalez Sanchez, who is the co-director at Beyond Academia, a nonprofit affiliated with UC Berkeley. Welcome, Angelica. Can you tell us a little bit about you and Beyond Academia? Of course. Hello, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here today. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm actually a PhD candidate in the Comparative Biochemistry graduate program at UC Berkeley, so I'm a graduate student, but I'm also co-director and logistics lead for the nonprofit organization Beyond Academia. So Beyond Academia is a nonprofit organization run entirely by graduate students and postdocs with the goal of empowering other graduate students and postdocs to pursue um, careers outside of academia. Um, and expand their options. So to educate them and expand their options. We accomplish these career education goals through a series of events, including our annual conference, um, workshops, tutorials, panels. Um, and the main objective is to connect academics with um, those who have transitioned to non-academic jobs. Wonderful, thank you so much. And next up we have Jason Harbour, who is event planning manager from Northwestern University. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, as you said, I'm a, an event planning manager for Norris University Center, which is a student union here uh, in beautiful Evanston, Illinois. Go Cats. Uh, I've been here before about six years. I do the event planning for all of our venues that are outside of the student union itself. So there are seven different venues. Um, and I think a little bit different than in Helga, where, where people come to us with their events already and we help produce them. Uh, for them. So that's kind of the way that we've utilized Hop, and it almost became kind of an eighth venue for us uh, as people started planning events in a more virtual and remote fashion. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And next and last but not least, I guess we have Ingrid who came on just in time. Welcome, Ingrid Jensen. She is the Executive Director of Student Services at Cornell's SC Johnson School of Business. Welcome, Ingrid. Thanks, Priya, and I apologize for joining late. I'm afraid of all the days the internet is down on my street, so I'm joining by mobile, so apologies that the sound is suboptimal. Um, so I run student services at our MBA program and also for a specialized master's degree, and we've used Hopin for current students and admitted students and really love it. Awesome, and we can hear you great, Ingrid. Thank you for, thank you for that. So before we jump in actually to the meat of our discussion, um, I'm curious about all of your experiences with online events in general and how you actually got involved in being the point person for your organization. Before the pandemic, were any of you hosting these types of online events for your students at your respective campuses? And if not, would you consider yourselves to be online event professionals today? So Ingrid, why don't we kick off with you? Certainly. So absolutely new to this due to the pandemic. Uh, we had to pivot really quickly last spring, as I know so many did. And truthfully, 
now we're really pro online events and I really see be a space moving forward where we're going to continue to use hop in and to engage with our audiences in this way when the time's appropriate. I think there will be some opportunities, opportunities for us to try hybrid online and in-person events in the future. And we're certainly continuing to do online events. We have another hop in event coming up this Friday. Awesome. Any other takers? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah I can jump. I I can jump in. Uh, we didn't do a lot of virtual or uh, sort of remote events other than um, some small blue jeans things, if, if anyone remembers blue jeans. <laughs> I do. Um, so we would use that to kind of connect our Chicago and Evanston campuses or, or the, the Cutter campus. But other than that, we weren't doing a lot of online things. Um, however, uh, like Ingrid was just saying, I, I definitely see a future for it moving forward in terms of the reach that we're able to get. We did a prospective housing uh, expo for students that are, are incoming next year, and we were able to get almost, a, I believe, a half of the incoming class to be able to see and explore and ask questions about housing in a way that they couldn't uh, if, if they couldn't come to campus before. Um, so this was just a way that increased accessibility, uh, increased reach. Uh, we had a lot of events that were able to involve alumni or just, you know, recently graduated students uh, in a way that they aren't able to necessarily do uh, with in-person events. And, and so that was been really great for us. Awesome. Yeah, same for us here at Beyond Academia. Before 2020, I think we had only hosted maybe one webinar using Zoom in 2019. Um, and then when the pandemic, we had to re-strategize and um, redesign all of our events in order to become virtual. Um, I definitely agree that we'll um, most likely continue to hold virtual events as well, or some kind of hybrid events. And um, yeah, this has definitely been a crash course on online events this whole year. So we're ready for that. I believe it. Well, it's probably safe to say you are all now online event professionals. So congratulations. <laughs> awesome. So next, I want to talk a little bit about the students that you actually support. Um, I think what's really interesting here is that each of you serves a different type of student. So Ingrid, I know you host events for prospective students. Jason, you host events for undergraduates. And Angelica, you create professional development conferences for actually graduate students and those getting their PhDs. So how do you decide kind of what, what sorts of events and specific events to create for each of those groups? And what do you think is really important to each of them? Um, Angelica, maybe you can kick us off here. Sounds great. Um, so some of the most important goals for our audience, uh, which are graduate students and postdocs, are learning as much as possible about careers for after they graduate or after they finish their training. Um, polishing their transferable skills and also networking because that's going to help them find a, a job after. Uh, so in order to fulfill those goals in our events, we take into consideration different things. So first of all, the Beyond Academia team is composed completely of graduate students and postdocs. So we know from experience what the needs of this audience are. Um, also, um, we have been holding professional development events for over nine years now. So we have a little bit of accumulated knowledge over the years. But I think most importantly, after every main event that we organize, we collect uh, feedback surveys um, and we uh, like to hear from our audience on what worked for them, what didn't work, what they would like to see next, what uh, things they would like to learn. Um, so all of these pieces of information definitely come together to um, design these events, whether online or in person. Awesome. I would say that when we're doing events, particularly for prospective student or admitted student audience, we really try to think about what are our goals of this event and then design the event to meet the goals. And so when we move to doing some of those, you know, people call them yield events or sell events online, you know, rather than take exactly what we were doing in person and just shift it to the online format, I really pushed our wider team to be smart and creative about thinking, let's take this back to the goals. What are the goals and how can the online format best serve those goals? And then, you know, what we really realize is that that particular audience, they're trying to decide what program they're going to select. 
they crave connection. And so mm -hmm. what Hopin allowed us to do was to create those opportunities for connection. You know, in person, you might connect with people just casually because they're who you happen to sit down next to for that session, or you end up in line, you know, for a cocktail at the reception, right? And you're chatting or you're chatting over the breakfast. Well, Hopin's networking feature and also the expo booth allowed us to create some of that um, serendipity, right? The mm -hmm. random pairings or you talk to who you talk to when you go to that particular expo booth versus this one. Um, and so creating that connection is really what drove our design. That's great. Yeah, I, I would say, as I mentioned, I think that Hopin kind of became like an eighth venue for me. So a lot of the things that we would do for in-person events kind of translated over in terms of like, you know, we'll do a lot of walkthroughs of the event space to ask them how they want it set up. And those sorts of communication, those sorts of conversations, I think, are the important part of making these events successful because you really need to dig deep and find out what are they trying to do? Because Hopin like has almost limitless possibilities in terms of how you can set it up and how you can utilize it. So what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do? And then some of the great conversations I remember, um, and Chris might be here, but uh, there was a gentleman I worked with on a poster session for, for our grad students uh, presenting their research. And, you know, it, we just had some really great in-depth conversations about how do we take this very, very in-person event yeah. to, to, to hop in so people can still see and enjoy the, the posters, ask questions, and, and that the students are also getting as much out of it um, and we were really able to utilize like the additional info area where we could put the posters down there so people could see that as well as while they're presenting. Uh, people, you know, people love to be able to pop in and out much like you could kind of if you were in a large venue walking around looking at the posters. So those those sorts of conversations to me were super influential in terms of the success of the event uh, and really helped us. That's awesome. That's such a unique use case of a poster session. I love that. Um, so thank you all for that. So I'm also curious to know what the response has been from your campuses to this, you know, this giant pivot to remote and virtual first events for students. Um, can you share any tips or tricks with our audience about how you've enabled your schools, your faculty, your students to be really bought into this idea of virtual events? Um, obviously, because so much of campus life is being there in person. So we'd love to know kind of how you got others excited about this. So um, Jason, maybe you can kick us off here. Yeah, I, I mean, the first thing I tell people is it's not Zoom. <laughs> which makes it special. Like, like we're, we're also used to Zoom and like there's a there's wonderful things about the comfortability that people have with Zoom and, and that's yeah. wonderful. And, and so there was some trepidation about using something that wasn't Zoom as well as, you know, just having to trust build that I am building the event how they want it built, you know, because they they aren't necessarily uh, having that access to the back end controls to see what I'm doing. So that was like the trust building and that. But the nice thing as well is that Hopin is very intuitive and, and it allowed for users once they got in there and once you set those settings, uh, like that it moved a lot the same way. And so people felt good and you were able to move in and out of rooms without people seeing Jason Harbor entered or Jason <laughs> Harbor left left the meeting, you know, that sort of thing, which I think was like super great and wonderful. And then uh, I think that the way I would usually get them excited is they would submit, um, we had a virtual, re a virtual re event request form. And so I would get a lot of the, like their initial thoughts and information about the event. And I would build a demo that was tailored to that, hmm. uh, that kind of would kind of show them the possibilities of, of what that event could be. And I would put, you know, I would stalk their websites and put videos or, or photos in from their information to kind of show them how it tailored to their event so that we could really start building that similar vernacular to, 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 to have that same vocabulary moving forward and, and just keep that momentum the whole time. That's great. I can go next. Um, so in in terms of the response or the feedback that, that we've gotten, for example, for our annual conference, which was the main event that we held on Hopin, um, it was overwhelmingly positive. We were able to host over 1,700 attendees and um, from institutions all over the world. And we collect surveys uh, from them and from the speakers. And everyone was uh, very happy with how easy it was to use the platform and also how accessible because we also made the event free. So everyone that wanted to join wanted to uh, could join. Um, and so 
um, the way that we were able to engage so many people was um, to, um, well, we had different strategies. First of all, um, in order to engage the speakers who might have been hesitant to switch to a whole completely new platform for them, uh, because most people have been using Zoom, as Jason mentioned, um, was to be um, as clear as possible with the instructions on how to use the platform. We had several dry runs, for example, with all the speakers together and individualized uh, dry runs of the event for those that needed um, some more one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, help. And also we created uh, video tutorials for the attendees and for the speakers and for the keynote speakers, which we shared ahead of time. And we also posted on the reception page of our event so that people could refer back to those um, if they needed help while the event was going on. Um, we also made sure to um, promote the event as a free event and open to everyone. Uh, and I think that made it really popular. Uh, we also had great speakers who promoted the event on their social media. We did as well, um, especially Twitter and LinkedIn were really useful to um, be able to reach a larger audience. Um, so all of those things and also our, our partnerships with um, other groups in Berkeley, such as uh, Grad Pro, the Graduate Division, QB3, SLAM, the Career Center, all of those also helped us promote this event and, and get people excited about it. That's awesome. So I'm hearing kind of trust, establishing trust, making things intuitive and accessible for everyone, the right kind of event promotion and marketing promotion for the event. Ingrid, anything else to add to that that, that was unique for you? Um, I would say that for us, the first event required a lot of trust, right? And a leap of positive reviews as Angelica. Oh, Ingrid, I think we're having- Was what got bought in and everybody excited. So to the people as observers, the first time you do a hop in event, it's really helpful. Great. Sorry, I think your internet was cutting out a little bit there, but we got the we got the gist of it, and we will move on to the next question here. Um, so next, I, I do want to also talk about the types of events that you've all utilized for Hop In. Um, Ingrid, I think you mentioned that you've used a platform for yield or sell events. Jason, you've used it for a variety of different purposes. I think one of my favorites was football watch parties, which is very unique. And Angelica, you've used it for professional professional development conferences as well. So can you share any kind of tips or tricks of what features inside the Hopin platform have been the most helpful in fostering community and connections amongst students? Sure, I, I'll jump in. Uh... You know, I think for, for both the football watch parties um, and for our, our large student fundraiser, the Dance Marathon, uh, the RTM, RTMP feature that was streaming to the stage was was huge. Uh, our athletics department did their own pregame show from the field uh, <laughs> each week, which was amazing. And they were just able to stream it from their media truck right to the stage. And then we would have various alumni groups in the sessions area that were uh, having watch parties and sharing the window, uh, et cetera. So that, that was really awesome. And for Dance Marathon, it kind of allowed us this was a couple months ago now, it allowed us to be kind of have our first hybrid event because uh, MCs were live in one of our venues being filmed uh, with the DJ, but they were mixing in all their other stuff. So we were able to send their feed right to the stage uh, and they had a switcher and whatnot to send the other content there. So that was really awesome. Uh, I love that we finally have a Q&A tool. That's, that's been super helpful uh, as scrolling chat can get really hard to fall, <laughs> find all the questions. Yes. Uh, and then I, I think we're going to talk about the expo more, but my favorite, uh, my favorite area is, is definitely the expo and, and, and how, we use, how, how we've been able to use that and how you can still keep that space activated, even if there isn't like live content going on throughout the event. Like uh, the fact that we've, a lot of our events have used the full 72 hours, even if the event itself was only two hours, because we've used the expo area to post record or to to have other content that they can watch asynchronously there uh, on their own time from around the world. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I'm myself learning and getting ideas for future events <laughs> from you, Jason. Uh, so uh, in terms of for our conference, it was a huge conference. So I think having the, the stage feature um, 
we used it to hold our keynote lectures, which are typically the most attended ones, and they were. We had over a thousand attendees for each keynote lecture. Uh, that was amazing that we were able to have um, that, that stage that holds a big audience. Um, if I can give a, a, a couple of tricks um, and tips of innovative ways of using the platform, for example, we use the sessions to hold our panels and workshops because we had a lot of concurrent panels and workshops. But something innovative that we did was that we created private sessions for our speakers and for our Beyond Academia organizing team, so the conference organizing team. Um, and those were like our panic rooms where we could go and discuss any issues that came up and chat with the speakers if they were having um, connection issues or were needing um, some help or something. So those the, having that private session just for the folks that we invited uh, was really useful. And also another tip, and also we're going to talk a little bit more about the expo, but we use the expo instead of for holding boots as information table. Mm -hmm. um, so we had um, folks from the Beyond Academia team there to answer more questions um, from the um, attendees or speakers. That's awesome. I mean, you guys are leading me exactly to my next question, which is all around the expo boots. And it's interesting because I, I hear, you know, so many different use cases of how people actually use the expo booth and it can get pretty versatile. So you guys have touched on it a little bit, each of you, but if you want to dig in kind of one layer deeper and talk a little bit about how you've uniquely used, um, use that area of hop in. Oh, sure. Uh, Let's see, one of the more, most recent examples we did, again, was at Housing Expo. Um, so we had uh, really awesome uh, Google slide presentations embedded into the booth that the students made that showed photos and like information about their dorm that, that was put together by them. And then we had certain windows of time where the students would come live on the booth to actually take questions from people that were in the event or uh, you know schedule time to meet to talk more about that area. And so it was really great because it allowed like I said, our international perspective students who were, you know, in completely different time zones, were still able to come in and like see the videos, you know, because we would uh, embed YouTube videos below as well uh, that had walkthroughs of the spaces. Uh, so I thought that that was really unique. Um, for the football games, we would open the event on Thursday and from Thursday till Saturday when the game was, it was all the booths and we would have interviews with players that were in there. We would have, um, you know, the, the apparel, a link to the apparel <laughs> store. The, the weirdest, the weirdest, uh, the, the booth that always got the most traction, weirdly enough, was the uniform reveal. So huh. like every week, every every week people would want to go see that because they would release the content uh, in the platform before they would put it out on social media. Yeah. So people really, really wanted to be ahead of the game. And it, and it looks like we got a lot of great engagement from that. So just using the, the, the slides feature, embedding videos, um, finding ways to creatively uh, bring live presentations in there. That's been really successful with other prospective student events we've done as well. Um, and and I, I think even like some of the job fairs we've had uh, videos or, or videos or information about the certain career and then the, the hiring manager would come on and talk to students mm -hmm. at certain points. So there's just a lot of amazing ways that you can use it and a lot of content that you can put in them for people to view in an asynchronous manner. That's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, as I mentioned before, we use the Expo booth as an additional um, resource center for attendees and speakers. So we just had one booth. It was Beyond Academia Information Table. And there was always a member of the Beyond Academia organizing team there to answer questions, whether on the chat or on video. Um, we also had links to different resources. Um, and I also wanted to point out that we um, took advantage of the reception page on our event to be able to um, uh, direct people to where they could find help. And one of those places was at the expo. So we had all the resources and information that they could need at the reception page, including, hey, if you need help, you can go to the expo and find our info table and we'll be there to help you out. That's great. So basically all the students, all the attendees for the event knew to go to the expo booth if they had any questions and awesome. That's great. Exactly. Ingrid, we got you back. <laughs> Anything Hi. to add to that question? We'll, we'll try it again. My apologies. No yeah, worries. We've used the Expo booth in a variety of ways. For every event, we've also had a hop-in help desk and had a staff member who was really hop-in savvy just sit there in case someone was having trouble. We called it the hop-in help desk, so similar to Angelica. 
We actually recently did an online orientation on Hopin and we did check-in in the expo area. So mm. students had check-in appointments at a particular booth. We named each booth with a number and signed them up in advance. And then they could check in, ask any questions they had. And when it wasn't time for their check-in appointment, they were engaged in networking, meeting the other brand new students and they loved it. Every time somebody came to check in, they kept saying, this networking is so cool. Um, for <laughs> one of our yield events, we use the expo for student club fair. So we had about 80 booths, one for each student club and people could just mix and mingle and go get information. Again, it was another way to create that connection. Wow. Very cool. Have you guys done, I think you might've mentioned this too, but student clubs as well in, in the expo booths. Has anyone done that? Yeah, we, we did that. Um, we've done that. We've again, like similar to kind of the job fair and thing, but, uh, um, yeah, it's another great way to utilize that area. Great. Awesome. So I know we have a lot of questions in the chat, so I will ask one more question for you all, and then we can probably move it over to the chat. So, Obviously, you know, navigating this new world has been very challenging and it has been an adjustment for everyone, safe to say. But I personally remember how fun college was with admission days, orientations, obviously the football games and all the organizations. So are there any kind of wish list items that you would like to see on the Hopin platform to kind of take some of these online experiences to the next level? Um, and we'll go around the horn here. So Angelica, if you wanna start first. Sure, um, so I think one of the aspects that we miss the most and that is really important for professional development and for exploring careers and career transitions is networking. And that's something that we are still hoping to further um, optimize. And if I could have a wish list, I would wish for more seamless networking opportunities that are similar to in-person networking. Um, so I think with um, things opening up a little bit, uh, we'll be able to complement the online networking with some in-person networking, at least um, on, on campus. Um, but that's one of the things that we miss the most and that I think could um, we could further improve for the future. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, I can add on that. I, I know um, I, I've been on a bunch of other platforms in terms of the networking where they can kind of have like cocktail tables or smaller tables mm -hmm. where you can actually see where you can actually see who's sitting at them before you go to them and you can lock the table like that sort of networking, like more of the small group, I think could be really beneficial as opposed. I know you can schedule the meetings, but it's kind of like an extra step or training point as opposed to just being able to go to say the sessions area and see the small table and I can see that Ingrid sitting there and I can sit down and yeah. chat with her. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and then for me, I think uh, the other way that would really help sell the platform even more is if there was an easier way to walk people through the platform without like screen sharing on zoom, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like in order to like kind of give them access to see what you're doing or how to experience it themselves because screen sharing it, it works and, and, and sure just like inviting them to the, the um, platform you can lose them, which is yeah. always fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, just some sort of way to help show things that's a little more engaging than than me just sharing it on my laptop. And I haven't I haven't seen a good idea for that. Um, but if you guys do create it and it takes off, I do want credit. <laughs> there we go. Noted. No, I love that idea. More immersive kind of demo. I like that. <laughs> and Ingrid, what about you? Um, I would. Definitely echo what Jason's saying about the cocktail tables or some way that you can navigate around. I wouldn't want to lose the one-on-one -on -one randomized networking that Hopin has now because we really mm -hmm. love that. I just think this would be an added bonus. The other thing is my wish list for academia would actually um, to be to add in a couple of components that would work a little bit like Zoom. So for example, I would love to have sessions where everyone could be on camera so you could do a live class because yeah. executive education in Hopin would kill because if you could have that networking between classes, right? Mm. That would be fantastic. Um, so why not let 40, 50, 60 people be on camera? The other feature would be is I would love to pair people to move small groups randomly into breakout rooms or to pre-assign them, you know, so even using your existing
interesting meeting function. If there was yeah. a way for me to set up all the meetings in advance, right? And so everyone, when they're in their event, would get it. Oh, at three o'clock, you're invited to this small group discussion with the, these five other people. That would just take it to the next level for us. That's super interesting. So more for the use cases of, you know, lecturing and small groups and round tables, things like that. Um, that's really interesting. I like that. Um, I'm going to do actually, I'm going to sneak in one more question here before we move into, into Q&A. But is there anything that each of you did at your virtual events on Hopin that was so popular amongst your attendees and students and faculty that you'd want to keep doing for the future? Uh, well, it's kind of funny because uh, one of our most popular ones uh, was for a winter holiday party where we 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 did Kahoot before Kahoot ah. was one of your before <laughs> Kahoot was one of your partners. Uh, we and go. like that game went that game went crazy, and we were just doing it, you know, in through the screen share way. But uh, I was really surprised at the popularity of that, and we used it at a few events uh, since. But no, I think um, popular. A, a lot of it is like the ability to 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 share to, to collect recordings and then repost them in the expo area so that people can come back and watch it. I think that that is just super valuable. Um, and, and, you know, it's a little time consuming on, on our side in terms of downloading all of them, putting them up on YouTube or wherever. But so if, the, if that could be streamlined, that'd be awesome. Uh, but people really enjoy that and love having that kind of uh, collection of the conference almost immediately. Plus one on uh, on Kahoot, we use Kahoot a lot internally as well, and it is a it's a game changer. So for anyone in the audience that has not used Kahoot yet for your Hopin event, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Check out the session after this. There we go. <laughs> yeah, just to add on to what Jason said, um, for us, I think the most popular thing uh, was definitely the um, opening up, being able to open up the event to anyone that wanted to join. That yeah. made it super popular and everyone was so happy because many people from other campuses have heard of our conference before, but due to the limitations of an in-person conference, we couldn't um, welcome everyone. Um, but adding on to what Jason said, uh, sharing resources, I think was also very popular. Uh, in an in-person conference, it's really hard to know who went to which session, unless yeah. you have them sign in every session that they attend. But on the online conference, we because Hopin collects all this data from each session, we had the contact information from on all attendees, and we were able to share resources with them directly, like share the slides or share important links or documents that we um, that were useful in the workshops or panels. Uh, so that was very popular as well, and it wouldn't have been possible in an in-person conference. Yeah, I love that. You can see where you know your attendees are spending the most time, what booths they're going to, so you can follow up kind of intelligently that way too. It's a great answer. Ingrid, what about you? I would say for us, the expo booth, similarly popular, the networking really popular. So having some time, even before the event starts, we learned after our, our first event, you want at least 15 minutes of people in the lobby. And I love that you can rename the lobby and into whatever you want it to be. Um, that's just hugely helpful, hugely popular. We did cool screen shares of Cornell videos. We always had really nice imagery right before going live on the main stage. And that was really popular because it gave people a taste of campus. Awesome, thank you. So now we will move over to Q&A. We've got a lot of questions from our audience. So we'll, we'll get started here. Um, how, how do you sell the networking feature to a group of shy or introverted academics? That's a ac academia folk, I guess. That's a, that's a good one to start with. And feel free, anyone who has an answer can just jump in. <laughs> At least for us, since our goal is about educating about um, transitioning out of academia and all of our speakers have already transitioned outside of academia, um, I think our main sell was you're going to be able to connect with folks that can become your mentors or can become potentially your, um, uh, can help you find a, a job or can become mm -hmm. your boss. Um, so I think it, in our case, we didn't have to do too much 
to promote the networking other than saying that because people were really open to engage and, and even share their contact info on the event chat, share their LinkedIn. So um, just reminding people that this is going to help you make important connections for your future was enough. That's great. Yeah, you're not alone. I am, I'm terrified I was... of networking. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I usually tell them, hey, I'm terrified. Don't worry about it. Um, so, you no, know, I tell them, you know, I, I, it, that it, I, I, I'm very honest with them. I, it, I tell them it freaks me out, but that when we've used it, it's been one of the most highly commented on parts of the yeah. event. And, and yeah. so you share that out. Um, I, I will also talk about how, you know, it can be very simple in terms of how you're matching people, et cetera. But we also did like a, a kind of a crazy game of Tetris with one of our job fairs where we matched up students that were interested in the finance sector with random employers from the finance sector. So they got three to five minutes to sit there. Uh, and like people were saying, the, to, to be able to share your kind of contact information in that way and connect uh, is, is really valuable and, and um, can add a lot to an event. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would add, don't be too worried about this. I was so worried about that, your very question before our first event, because we were going to have a lot of students from cultures that are traditionally associated with being more shy, students that we see having trouble embracing networking when they're here. I really was skeptical it would work. We kept the networking time short and everybody used it. You get the stats afterwards. <laughs> we were flabbergasted and everyone was extending the time too. And yeah. it was the highest rated thing afterwards. And similarly in other events, we've continued to add and extend the networking um, and again, to us, you know, people on our team are like, wow, you're just going to this thing, hitting this random button. You don't know who you're going to get. Um, but I would say we just have not had that problem. And so I, I understand where the question is coming from. And I just have to say, I've been pleasantly surprised by how popular it is. It's, it's so true. I think the time limit also helps, right? When you're in person, a, a networking meeting can go on for sometimes a little too long. And here, you know, you have a cutoff of however long you really want it to be, and then you can have the option to extend the time. So that that certainly helps. Um, next question is, what metrics have you guys been tracking for, for the events that you plan in terms of KPIs or success? Uh, I usually collate a bunch of information um, since digging through all of the CSVs can be a little cumbersome for uh, for clients. I, I, I usually collect, you know, the registration data, the turnout data, how many people were at each different schedule item or in, in each different session and for how long they share, stayed. And I kind of collect all that. I, and then I add the, um, you know, registration list um, so that people can see who exactly attended. And I just kind of so I've used all of the different data that it collects and um, it is it is a little tricky and you do have to kind of walk people through all of it um, because if you just kind of send them that zip file, they might be a little overwhelmed. Fair. Um, That's great. Yeah, I can echo what um, Jason said. Uh, mostly for us, the most relevant piece of information is how many people attended per session because that mm -hmm. helps us design our future conferences and see what was what um, panels and workshops were more relevant for folks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I don't share all the raw CSV files. It's too much data, but I, I sort of curate a PowerPoint slide presentation afterwards on what we saw. And I'm really interested in the MPV score. Obviously, I'm re really interested in the attendance and how long people stayed. And what yeah. we've seen, we've done about five or six pretty significantly large events recently, is that people aren't dropping out or, or leaving early. And so that's really an important indicator for me. I'm really interested in which expo booth um, mm -hmm. is the most popular, sort of what are the four to five booths that are the, the top visited booths, the average length of stay in those booths to sort of understand. And again, for that input for future event design. And then I look pretty closely at the networking because I'm really curious about, again, speaking to those concerns, what percentage of unique individuals were engaged in the networking for how many sessions, for how long, um, and then we tend to do our own follow-up survey again to collect 
data and I fold that in as well. I, I really think seeing that attendance, you know, it's a huge concern in online events. Oh, well, people drop out or multitask, but you know, the hop in data is really powerful and you can tell that people are fully engaged and we're not seeing people drop out early. Yeah, absolutely. So we might have time for maybe one to two more questions here. So um, I do like this question, but with, with the eventual kind of return to work for many in the coming months, is your plan to continue using the virtual format in the same degree you all are now? At least in Vienna Academia, oh, sorry. Oh, um, no, go ahead. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, at least in Beyond Academia, we're still trying to figure out what to do next year because, of course, it will depend on how things are going on with the pandemic. But we are definitely considering having um, hybrid events just because having the virtual uh, part really helps us uh, reach even more people, which is yeah. amazing. And it really, um, it really makes us feel like we're actually making some something important and, and making some change. Uh, but we do miss some things of the of the in person um, events. So we might go for hybrid for uh, events, especially if they imply networking. Um, yeah. We might use virtual for smaller events. So we're still trying to figure it out. But definitely having this crash course in virtual events helped us see the the advantages that they have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was I would say the same. We're 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 getting ourselves ready to make sure that we can still offer hybrid solutions. Um, we definitely have already seen kind of a, a, a you know, a, a falling off the cliff a little bit of, of interest in virtual events. I think it's because Illinois finally opened up a little bit more. So people are like, oh my God, I need to do everything in person for the rest of my life. Uh, that's not going to be the case forever. Um, you know, like I said, the, the housing expo, we've already talked about how we can use that again next year uh, to supplement what they are, the great programming they already do. Uh, I could see something like the football still doing the tailgate sort of thing because that really engaged alumni from all over the country. Like NU Club of Dallas would show up mm -hmm. with their 25 people to watch together. That's the NU awesome. Club of Sacramento, like every week, it was really great. And like, to, it, it's hard to to engage that that at that level uh, consistently. So uh, I think those are so, the sorts of conversations we're going to find in the events that we're going to end up kind of uh, um, gravitating towards. Yeah, makes sense. Ingrid, anything to add to that question or that answer? <laughs> I would say exactly the same answer for us. Um, you just, the reach you get, particularly with an international audience, is outstanding. So we'll definitely be doing um, events that formerly were only in person. We'll be shifting several of the big marquee events to hybrid. And then yeah. there are some events that we used to do in person for more niche master's programs that I think might make sense to make fully virtual going forward. Makes sense. Yeah. So even those those events that you guys did have, you know, that were that were in person, they might go back to in person. But adding that digital component to make it hybrid, to reach a bigger audience, make it more accessible is is kind of the themes that I'm hearing. Well, well, thank you all of you so much for joining today. Um, we will be sharing the recording after the event if you have any friends or colleagues who missed out. So we have about 15 minutes left for networking. So everyone gets to check out this networking feature that we talked about today, have one-on-one -on -one conversations and meet one another. Also be sure to check out hopin.com backslash education to understand kind of how, how others are using, um, using Hopin in the higher ed space. And also in our Expo Lounge, you'll see that we have some upcoming events, specifically Illuminate, which is one you do not want to miss. So thank you all so much for your time and see you next time.